and ran it through faucets, it would be enough water to take care of every man, woman, and child in the United States for 47 days. So these brave and giving Texans we've watched have a road ahead that is almost too long to imagine. Back here after tomorrow's holiday, the school bells will ring in the state's largest school district. First day of school under the new superintendent, Nikolai Vitti. I've said before on this program that one of the great blessings of my life was being born to parents who were very serious about my education. Parents who surrounded me with books. Parents who raised me to believe that college was not optional. That is a real blessing. And Vidi wants that blessing visited on many more of Detroit's children. He is focused right now in a profound way on Detroit schools' parents. What kind of impact can he have in that strategy? And what is fair to ask of parents? We'll also ask him about the teacher shortage going into the year. Nikolai Vidi is here this morning. And then I have uh, been impressed before uh, by the data and analysis delivered by Detroit Future City. They're at it again, a study entitled 139 Square Miles. Where can it lead us? The executive director of Detroit Future City, Anika Goss Foster, is here too. It's all today on Flashpoint. We have heard the name and we've heard had conversations with Nikolai Vitti for quite a while now, but when you really get down to it, he's only been on the job as superintendent of Detroit schools for two months. And here we are heading into this week's start of school in Detroit. Very happy to have Dr. Vitti with me this morning. Thanks very much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Because I know you've had a few things going on. <laughs> um, but let's start with uh, this enormous shortfall that you have of teachers. As you and I are recording this conversation, still about 250 shy of, uh, you almost need 3,000 teachers in Detroit. Detroit. Uh, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so uh, we have a job fair uh, tonight. Um, As we record this, that was, right. yes, that's yeah. this past. Um, yes. But, you know, with 250 vacancies, uh, we have 50 uh, pending, so meaning people have agreed to, to come on board and it's just a matter of processing their paperwork and placing them. Um, and, and then when we look at 250 versus last year at the same time, uh, we had 279 vacancies at the opening of the school year last year mm -hmm. compared to this year, and we've picked up almost a dozen new schools with EAA transition. Yeah. And of the 250 vacancies, um, over 50 of them are linked to the EAA. So in fact, uh, we're better positioned than last year. But with that said, we know uh, every child deserves a fully certified full-time teacher the first day of school. Um, our systems need to improve to recruit uh, teachers in advance. We've done a lot uh, this year in a short amount of time in recruiting over 200 teachers already. Put things in perspective, last year from January to the end of the school year, the district only recruited 30 new teachers. Yeah. Um, so um, we've increased the salaries that we can offer retired teachers. We just completed a collective bargaining agreement uh, to increase first year teacher salaries and salaries of all teachers. And, and we're gonna improve the culture and climate, working conditions of our teachers so that they stay in our schools the district and they wanna come. Two things about this uh, particular issue. You said certified, and that's an important distinction because state law actually allows you to hire anybody who will, is willing to teach almost in Detroit schools, but you're not willing to do that. You're, uh, these have to be certified teachers to your way of thinking. Uh, we have not lowered the bar on, on any level. Level. Uh, we are hiring only certified teachers, and I think that's the expectation that our community, our parents, and, and our, our children deserve. There's been a sense that we don't get the best teachers because of the challenges of this district. How do you attract better and brighter teachers at all? Never mind the fact that trying any right now that you need to hire to fill out these spots, but how do you get the best and brightest into this district that so badly needs them? Yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that um, our teachers that are currently in our school district are some of the best teachers in the state. Uh, when you go about doing the day-to-day -day work with our children and the challenges that they bring in, into the classroom, you have to have a certain skill set and rep repertoire of experiences and, and, and really um, tools and talents to overcome the challenges that our children bring. And I think those skill sets and that experience even is um, needed more in, in a place like Detroit than even some surrounding suburban districts. So I would argue we have some of the best teachers um, in the state of Michigan and in the country. When we talk about recruiting, 
Um, I think that we can do a better job of recruiting the best and the brightest to come to Detroit. Um, and I think we're going to do that. Ultimately, every teacher wants to make a difference in a child's life. And there's no better place to make a difference than Detroit when you look at the scale of the challenge, but also the scale of the opportunity. Well, let's talk about the scale of the challenge a little yeah. bit. Uh, we, in fact, in, in the report that we're going to be talking about later with Anika uh, Goss-Foster, the level of poverty is overwhelming right mm -hmm. now in the city of Detroit. That, of course, has ramifications for you. Um, single family households, all of these different challenges that even as Detroit is starting to succeed in a lot of places, these are the things that haven't changed. Well, I mean, I think this goes back to why our teachers are some of the best. Um, because despite those same obstacles, we, we, we hear countless stories of children going on to college, uh, children going to the... Would we say uh, countless uh, stories? Or, I mean, they're well, still the exception, are. aren't they? I, I wouldn't say the exception. I, I, I mean, I think when you look at the number of children that we were just looking at some data uh, today, the number of, of our students that go on to college, um, go to the military, go to the, uh, into careers, uh, and you look at the challenges that they're overcoming to do that, a lot of that um, success is because of the school system itself. Now, we all know we can do better, and we all know we have to scale that, so it's not some, um, but all. And I think that's what we're working to do as we rebuild this district. Something you and I talked about uh, up on Mackinac Island this year and now has come back and is a big focus of yours as parents. Uh, I, I always, the, 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 there's no getting around the truth that educated parents tend to end up with educated children. They see the, they, they put a primacy on it. And that's your focus that you've talked about now for the last couple of weeks is getting parents to buy in. Uh, talk a little bit about these expectations that you're placing on parents, which is a different kind of homework. <laughs> well, I've, I've never met a parent uh, that didn't care about their child's education. Um, I've met parents that have struggled in school when they went to school. Uh, they feel sometimes intimidated by the school district, in, intimidated by the education process, or feel hypocritical pushing their children to do well in school when they did not. Mm. Um, and so what we're going to do differently as a district is meet parents at where they are when they enter the school district. We're going to create a parent academy uh, in Detroit, which will build the co confidence and capacity of our parents to advocate for their child's education. Uh, we'll offer classes on what questions to ask during parent-teacher conferences, how to uh, promote literacy in the home, um, how to even apply basic uh, math in the kitchen. Uh, we'll also offer classes on how to help parents be a better parent, uh, issues of discipline, conflict resolution, um, selecting friends and monitoring that and then monitoring social media. And then lastly, we're going to help parents become what I call the whole parent, really hard to advocate for your child's education when you're trying to uh, make the literacy bill. Uh, or pay that and so we'll offer classes on how to build a resume, how to um, go on job interviews and how to build financial literacy. So you're trying to move it beyond just here's what you need to do with your child's schooling but you are asking for enormous engagement and commitment and teachers that I talk to all the time talk about if you look at parents night at a school in at say Gross Point South where I've right. had some experience it's difficult to get through the hallways on parents night and some Detroit teachers talk about you could fire a cannon off in the hallways on parents night and not hit anybody. Well, so, yeah without question it makes the educational process more difficult it puts additional strain and weight on our principals and our teachers and yeah, that's why yeah. I say that the work in Detroit is harder work than in other districts and that's why we need to pay our teachers at the premium level because the work is more difficult but despite those challenges we do have examples, countless examples, I think, of children overcoming those odds and, and principals and teachers working through those obstacles to make sure that children are successful. I mean, I, I think as a school district, we, we, we already do a great job of taking children where they are and, and giving them back to the community and parents at a higher level. We just have to do that at scale and we have to accelerate that improvement um, so that we can go back and talk about DPS the way um, generations uh, ago talked about DPS. I mean, d over two decades ago, DPS was considered one of the best urban school districts in the country. And over um, bad management at the local level, bad policy at the state level, yeah. the district has deteriorated. So this work now with the newly elected board, um, an appointed superintendent that has a track record of success in the urban core, we're going to rebuild that district and restore the legacy that was part of one of the best urban school districts in the country. Uh, Jaime Escalante, a famous teacher, used to talk about there are two kinds of, of discrimination in schools. There's lowering the bar 
and there's not lowering the bar. Either way, it can be seen as, I guess, detrimental. Where do you stand on the standards that you expect from Detroit students? Well, I think we always have to be empathetic and sympathetic to the challenges that our children bring to the school system. Yeah. Um, but it ultimately, it's our responsibility to have the highest level of expectations for children. We, we need to go about our day-to-day -day work with the expectation that children need to be college ready or work, for, work, um, work ready, uh, career ready, and then also life ready. So we shouldn't have different expectations on children that are coming from um, the communities of Detroit as opposed to communities in Growth Point or Northville. Um, but we have to take into account the challenges that students bring with them so we can problem solve through those challenges, create the right safety net, the right support structure. That's why we, we, we're starting to talk about the need for a weighted student formula when you look at um, funding from, ta from Lansing um, to school districts. Ultimately, just by giving children the same dollar amount as far as an allocation, uh, what is equal is not always equitable. Yeah. And I think that's what we have to start changing the conversation. So a child who's growing up in poverty, a child who is an English language learner, a child with special needs, um, requires additional support than a child who doesn't. And that's not only in the context of Detroit, that's in the context of Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, anywhere in, in the state of Michigan. And, and that's why it shouldn't be an excuse, those factors shouldn't be an excuse, but we should account for that in how we fund public education. They're delicate. Um, you've been around Detroit now to know that all these conversations about where we want Detroit to go as a city really run head on, head first. They, they always end with we're only going to get as far as our education system takes us. You, you must have now, by now become fully aware well, of that yeah, part of the conversation. Well, it's, yeah, it's common sense. Ultimately, you can uh, see an economic revival in Detroit simply by visiting the downtown area. Uh, there's a great deal of energy related to economic development, but ultimately um, folks won't l stay in Detroit or move to Detroit as far as their homes or permanent, permanent residencies, especially long, young families, unless we have a stronger public school system. Um, and that will never be addressed at scale through charter schools. Individual charter schools may do well with children, but that's not an at-scale solution. The at-scale solution is restoring um, the strength and pride of a traditional public school system. And that's what we're working to do, and, but I don't think we're doing that alone. I, I think um, the, the mayor has stepped in, stepped up to um, offer more business opportunities. Businesses are starting to step up. You see that with the Randolph investment. Uh, that was announced this past week. So there are examples of people now putting their shoulder to the wheel um, so that we're not working in isolation or alone to rebuild this district. Last thing I want to ask you is then how will you, and this goes back to the slide of where you move the bar. I know you don't want to move the bar lower for yourself. How are you going to measure your success in Detroit this year? Well, I, I think uh, a couple things. Uh, one, we need to improve morale of our teachers. Um, so that's going to be uh, a barometer point, if you will. Um, when we talk about teacher vacancies um, going into next year, uh, we shouldn't be talking about 250 vacancies. We should be talking about a dozen or yeah. so. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, we need to talk about enrollment increasing the following year. Um, and then the following year, we have to talk about students being at m more at grade level and above in reading and math and science and social studies. So that's all about systems and processes that I think we're going to develop. Um, in fact, I know we will develop and, and it's all about inputs that lead to outputs. And outputs are some of the, the factors that I just spoke to. We've all got a lot riding on your success. Con uh, good luck with the year ahead and I really Thank appreciate you. your time this morning. Thank you for having me. We come back, we'll talk about the latest report for Detroit Future Cities. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Welcome back. We have talked before and often on this program about the work of Detroit Future City. Here is their latest uh, entry into that very thick now pile of work. Uh, it's a report called 139 Square Miles. Very happy to have with us the executive director of Detroit Future City, Anika Foss-Goster. Uh, Foss-Goster. Goss-Foster. Let me try it that way. <laughs> um, I, this is uh, fascinating to me. I, I, I'm curious, though, before we start, as to whether you find this big drill down on where we are in Detroit to right. be mostly positive or mostly negative. That's a really good question. I think it's both. Um, I think that there were many, many things that we already knew were going to be negative. Mm -hmm. 
I think we were probably surprised by some of the real positive changes, like the substantial changes in job growth, mm -hmm. like the uh, b beginning of being able to see stabilization throughout the city, not just in the neighborhoods that you think about, uh, and to be able to see uh, the slowing down of the population decline. Uh -huh. yeah, like which... those are all really positive, positive trends. Challenges, though, as I was just mentioning to yes. Dr. Vitti, remain because the picture that this paints of Detroit poverty is still very sobering. It's, it's not only sobering. Um, I think what was the most striking for me and for the staff at Detroit Future City was how urgent uh, the issues are, that it's not just in one area. It's not just uh, compartmentalized as poverty is a social issue. Poverty is an economic issue and it's also related to race uh, now in Detroit, which is something we've talked about, that race sure. and poverty sure. is an issue in Detroit. But now that we can clearly see it's affecting our ability to grow as a city, Right? We can't grow if the majority of our of Detroiters aren't participating in the economic development progress that we're making uh, here in Detroit. Poverty also, though, it means so many things. It has ramifications for how healthy we are That's as right. a city. Uh, it has, it obviously has implications for education. I mean, it, it spreads right. into so many different things. In fact, one thing on health care that I was surprised to read, uh, our, uh, the HIV rate in Detroit is more than double. Yeah. We haven't talked about this right. in a while, but it's more than double the national rate. That's right. And I, I was really surprised about the health numbers as well because I thought we made so much progress uh, in those areas and you know for every single section it could be its own report oh, so there's but, no doubt. yeah yes. so yes. it doesn't really it doesn't go into it doesn't do a deep dive into all of the sections it's really designed to make you ask more questions just yeah. as just as you've done the other thing that was uh, another of, of the many things that mm -hmm. I found interesting in here uh, all of our struggles that we have over transportation one is laid bare in here as to why it's so important we have in the city of Detroit so so many people who leave Detroit for their jobs and so many people who come into right. Detroit to work in the city so you've got people going in and out and yet no real uh, at least we're getting there well, but no real comprehensive plan approach on, on, or on transportation yes. and I think if you even you know layer that with the kinds of jobs that people are commuting for there are more yeah. Detroiters that are commuting for very low income jobs service jobs, right. service yeah. jobs and there are people who are commuting into Detroit for the much higher wage jobs yeah. and so that in and of itself is a problem right it, it, it really speaks to we're missing which to me was probably the most striking thing about the report is this missing middle yeah that yeah. we're if you look at the income section where you can see the bigger divide if you look at the at, at the population that we have lost, it's our middle income families with children. Yeah. And if the jobs aren't here, right, if, you're, if that's not who we're hiring, if that's not who's getting these jobs, then they're moving elsewhere, they're leaving town. That is where we really need to focus. When we talk about some of the good news, one of the things that I found that was really um, heartening, I think, is that for as much as the talk as we've set, talked about how much good things are happening in Midtown and Downtown mm -hmm. and what's happening everywhere else, your report actually finds that um, things are becoming a lot more stabilized in a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of not just the ones yes. that get the press. I, you know, there's a, there's a map um, that uh, we actually have in the stabilization section that really shows sort of the gradation of blues from areas with high disinvestment to areas that are actually showing, and it's really by growth and permits pulled. So where there's actual, people are either rehabbing or building new in these neighborhoods neighborhoods and so we're calling that's how we sort of measured stabilization yeah, yeah. and so for I remember 20 years ago working in Detroit and seeing a similar map and the whole map was the same shade right, right? it was right. all bad right and so now to see this map with all these different shades where it's really clear places that you may not even expect that are growing and thriving in places that we thought, okay, maybe those neighborhoods are coming up, but now we right. have the data that says, no, those places are actually improving and it's not just downtown and midtown, yeah, yeah. it's throughout the city. It's fascinating. So data has been created, what the data, that the way we are has been created by a lot of political and yeah. planning decisions in the past, but now the data that we look at can help us 
us hopefully make decisions for the future. Uh, yeah. What's actionable yeah. from what you see here and what kind of recommendations are you coming yeah, up with? Yeah, I think there's a lot that's really actionable. I think there's a lot that we still have to learn, that we still need to sort of unpack. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that um, we at Detroit Future City are really hoping to affect and, and work with and collaborate around is the issue of entrepreneurship and businesses of color. Yeah, um, I yeah. think that was probably one of the most striking disparities in the report. Depressing. Um, yeah. Actually. Though. And especially because there's so many resources available right now, specifically for businesses in Detroit to, to start new small businesses. But if those businesses aren't growing, right, if, they're, if, if, if the majority of those businesses only have one employee, and if a white business opens up and they immediately can, it, it, according to the, the data, it looks like they can immediately open up and hire employees. Yeah, then yeah. That, the message that sends is that we're not a city of new entrepreneurs and small businesses. And that's just not true. Right. It's yeah, not. Yeah. So there, there has to be a, a connection. And I think that's a great point for us to be able to come together as a community and as a city. I think the jobs and the business community have a great opportunity to really be actionable about economic inclusion and how we actually build Detroiters and build skills and opportunities for Detroiters to have pathways to this middle income that we're missing. And that was fascinating because it's not just a matter of minorities because you do right. see many minority groups are business owners. It, it, in particular, it was African Americans that, that yeah. are not getting uh, that what they growing. need to on the, on the entrepreneurial That's right. scale. Yeah. That's right. Fascinating stuff. Anika, thank you very much for Thanks being for here. Thanks for having I, me. I haven't quite gotten through all of it, but I hope you haven't either because <laughs> okay. it's a lot to think about. Yes. And as you said, a lot still to unpack. Thanks for Absolutely. coming. Absolutely. We'll you. wrap things up for Flashpoint this morning right after this on Local 4.